Give Mike a big God bless you as he comes today. I love you, New Life, and I know this man does too. I love you, buddy. Thank you, Pastor Allman. New Life Church, we're blessed with an amazing, amazing preacher. Give it up for our pastor. We love you. We honor you. We uh, traveled when we first arrived in August. We traveled down south to a state called Georgia. Talked to a few pastors down that way who had some bragging on Pastor Dave to do. They could not stop singing the praises. I want you to know that we listen to the live stream, the podcast, as if we try to watch it live. The anointing goes across the pond, and it's there, and we love, we love our pastor. We're so glad to be with you today. As, as Pastor Dave said, this is our last Sunday. We leave Wednesday of this week. We're flying back out to Scotland. And before I move on, we have our moms here and our family. If you'll just stand for a moment. One of the, the things of being a missionary is it seems like you're constantly saying goodbye. And I had an a epiphany, if you will, one time at the airport. Those of you that are travel and use an airport, an airport is a neutral place, but you have somebody that's saying goodbye. And you'll look across the way and you'll see somebody that's being re reunited and, and back together. So for our moms and for our families, they have the hard task of saying goodbye to us once again as, as we travel uh, back across the pond. And lastly, uh, my wife, Sherry, if you'll stand, please. She's going to kill me for doing this. But I could not do what I do without my Sherry. I call her my Lady J. But thank you for having us today. And I just, before I begin to share the word, I just want to remind you, New Life Church, how amazing that you are. It was around 2009, 2010, we had that thing, that R word that happened in our area across the U.S., even the recession. And many churches were uh, just feeling the pinch as, as ev all of us were. But New Life Church took the call of God and they took a step of faith in regards to missions and stepped out. And they sent not one, which is amazing, but two families from this church to the mission field. At a time that the recession was going on, that wisdom would say this isn't the time to do that. In fact, then New Life was an example to other churches and said, if they can do it, we can do it too. And you responded to the call of God in the area of world missions. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We could not be doing and serving in, in a foreign land without you. And each life that is touched, you are a part of because we're together. We're doing this together. And we thank you for that. And, and as Pastor Dave was saying, we, we have to leave this week. We would have loved to have been with you for your missions convention. Come. Come. And I hope that that reignites the fire within you in regards to missions, both local and abroad. Come and be a part of what God is doing around the world. I want to share with you today, and I have a, a two-hour clock set on my phone, so I'm, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. They just changed the clocks back in Scotland, so instead of five hours, we're four hours different. So that gives me one extra hour uh, to preach, but if you hear my stomach growling, I apologize. I'm doing my best. But one of the questions that we get asked a lot, probably more than any other question, is why do you do what you do? In 2009, Sherry was an assistant vice president bank manager with Huntington Bank. And I worked for Ohio Edison. But let me back up a few years. In 1997, we went on our first mission trip. We went to a place called Lima, Peru. And it messed us up. And I would encourage you, each and every one of you, if you have never gone on a mission trip, I encourage you to go to see what God is doing around the world. And so people would ask us, why do you do what you do? And I remember in Peru, we were there as part of the construction team. I have no construction experience whatsoever. 
But I went. And we were building this church, and we were putting in laying block. And you would have been impressed. I was, by day three, I was on scaffolding, and I had plumbed in a window, and I, it was amazing. But there was a woman that was there. And on this site that we're trying to build this building, she lived in the bathroom, in the outhouse. She lived in a bathroom. And every morning she would come out and sing songs to us and had the joy of the Lord spilling over every single day. And it messed us up. And there's sometimes in life you see something and you just can't be the same. And we were just struck to the core. And then fast forwarding a bit, we watched this movie that came out I think in the early 90s called Schindler's List. Have any of you seen Schindler's List? At the end of the film, he finds himself wishing that he had saved more people. He found that people are the true great commodity. And in the film, these are a few scenes from the end, they inscribed to him a ring. And it says this on the ring that they inscribed, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. And in the film, as the war is coming to an end, he resents having his car. And if you remember in the film, he has a gold pin. And he's like, this pin is gold. I could have got at least one, maybe two more people. He regrets all the money that he wasted because that was lives that could have been saved. And he begins to weep. And the next slide, he's weeping and they're consoling him and all the people come around him. And in that moment, in that scene of that film, I felt like that for us. I didn't want to look back one day and wonder what could have been. We could touch lives today. There was people that are lost. There's people that don't know that there's a God that loves them. And so we didn't want to look back. And wisdom would say sometimes, wait till you're old, wait till you're retired, and then you could dedicate most of your life. And we said, we want to give God the best years of our lives. We don't want to wait. We don't want to wait till we're retired. Let's give God the best years of our lives. One thing that God has for each of us, God calls each of us to obedience. That's what God has called us to. We are all called to obey what God has asked us to do. Not everyone can go to the mission field. There are people who can go into their prayer closet with a gift or a, a burden of intercession and can touch the world. And God could bring faces and countries and borders before their eyes and they can affect the world right where they are. We're all called to obedience. What has God asked us to do? And so I have a question. What kingdom are you building? A kingdom, by definition, is a piece of land that is ruled by a king or queen. A kingdom is often called a monarchy, which means that one person, usually inheriting their position by birth or marriage, is the leader or head of state. In most kingdoms, there's a dwelling place for a monarchy, and it is usually a palace or a castle. Most people would say their home is their castle. In Scotland, we have many castles. In fact, the picture behind this, the uh, slide there is Edinburgh Castle. And it's seen from all over. It's up on the hill, and you could see it from all over the city where you go. And it is a military fortress to this day. It's still a barracks of the military. Some of the castles around Scotland are just broken down rocks. Time and age has got to them. And there's many others who are still inhabited. And there's families that have been owners of those castles for generations. Where we live, there is a monarchy. There is the queen that is the queen of England. But we also live within a kingdom. And its official title is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And this helped us to understand the idea of living within a kingdom. Coming from the United States, we have a president, we don't have a king or queen. When we become born again, 
when we have professed faith in Christ and we begin to follow Christ, He now becomes the Lord of our life. He becomes the King on the throne of our heart. One thing that we notice in a kingdom, the king is in charge in the kingdom. He may have advisors, he may take counsel, but what the king says goes. What kingdom are we building? We cannot be building a kingdom of our own and God's kingdom. What kingdom are we building? When we moved to a new country, we placed ourselves under their laws, their statutes, and decrees. And if we would ever go on to citizenship, we would have to take an oath of allegiance, or in their verbiage it says an affirmation, if you prefer not to swear by God, and a pledge. So you take an oath and a pledge. And it means that you will promise to respect the rights, freedoms, and laws of the country. And when we become followers of Christ, He then is our King, and we're to pledge allegiance to Him. Jesus says it like this in Matthew 6, 33, and I'm going to read it to you from the Amplified. You can follow along on the screen, or you can have it on your phone or your, in your Bible. Matthew 6, 33, but seek... So it's something that you're looking for, to seek. Seek, aim at, and strive after, first of all, there's a connotation, first of all, His kingdom, the Lord's kingdom, not our own, and His righteousness, His way of doing and being right. Then all these things taken together will be given to you besides. We should be seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. And that means that we should be trying to do the right thing that God would require to be righteous. The kingdom of God is often used in reference to God's visible work on earth. It is called the kingdom of heaven to indicate that the origin of the work is God's heavenly work on earth, the kingdom of heaven. It's an invisible kingdom. If you remember, Jesus his disciples were asking would he restore the kingdom at this time. They kept thinking it was going to be a physical, an, a kingdom right now. That he was going to be the king and he was going to overthrow Rome. But his kingdom was an invisible kingdom that he's building and has been building for a long time. Paul says this in 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. Take with me your share of hardship, passing through the difficulties which you are called to endure, like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier in active service gets entangled in the ordinary business affairs of civilian life. He avoids them so that he may please the one who enlisted him to serve. Have you ever heard of soldiers that are deployed? that are looking at property and looking to move their family there to the war zone and set up their home? No, they're there on orders, following orders to do what their commanding officer has said. They are on mission. Friends, we're on mission. God has a mission for us to do. In fact, we have the great co-mission. We are called to do something. And a soldier has orders to follow. Soldiers don't go to the front lines with just an idea and a plan. They have orders to follow. And hopefully they have a strategy to win. I got some good news though, friends, for us. We have been given authority and power from our king. May we live our lives to please the one who has called us to active service. All of us are like soldiers in this life. We're sojourners. Heaven is our home. In fact, our citizenship, the Bible says, is in heaven. When we were moving all those years ago, 
In 2010, we were selling our house. We lived in North Lima. And Sherry had commented that we're putting in our change of address to kingdom of heaven. Because at that time, we had no home. <laughs> we had no car. We had no keys to anything in the world, if you will. But we're citizens of heaven. Soldiers follow orders of their commanding officer. And we too have orders to follow. And this is what it means by definition. We have what we know as the Great Commission. But this is what it means to be commissioned. It means that you are entrusting a person, a group, with supervisory power or authority. It is an authoritative order, charge, or direction. It is authority granted for a particular action or function, or a document granting such authority. We have been commissioned. We have marching orders that our commander-in-chief has given us. We have a world that needs to hear. And we have been commissioned in His power, in His might, in His authority. And Jesus says this, and even we were sharing it in the video before this, in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And it even says, if you have in your Bible, it has the little uh, headline before the paragraph, and this is known as the Great Commission. And I've heard preachers say it's not the Great Suggestion, it's the Great Commission. We are commissioned to do this. Jesus came up in verse 18, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus come up and said to them, All authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Help the people learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance, and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. So our commander-in-chief has given us orders to go and make disciples. That's what he's commanded us to do. And so we may say that it is not in my ability to go to another country or a foreign land, but God might have you share your faith at Target. God might ask you to share your faith at the car dealership. I remember years ago, we were uh, at Sweeney on Market Street, and we were looking at cars. This was probably about 2003. And the guy was driving us around at that time. They had a golf cart, and they would take you. Their lot was so big. And I'm sitting next to the guy, and he's explaining to me about cars. He's a salesman. And I'm sitting there, and I'm feeling God tell me to say something to him. And I'm like, I'm at the car lot. Like. But my take always is that I would be a, a fool in the eyes of the world than a fool in the eyes of God. And I thought, God, I always want to obey, even if to me it sounds silly or seems silly. Or, but so I said to the man, began to share with him, and, and he began to break down, and, and he actually was very angry. He was part of a church years ago that hurt him deeply. And I certainly didn't want to, you know, touch a sore spot. But I was able to share with him as we were driving around. That was not what I went there for and was not expecting that God would ask me to share at the car lot. But God calls each of us to go, to go and tell and make disciples. That's what he wants us to do. In the ancient word, in the ancient sense of what a disciple is, it's not the same. We've used this or have this idea that being a disciple is in the modern sense of being a student. Oh, I get some books, I follow some, some lessons, but that's not what it is in the connotation of the biblical text. A disciple in the ancient biblical world actively imitated both the life and teaching of the Master. It was a deliberate apprenticeship which made the fully formed disciple a living copy of 
the master. We have to be disciples to disciple. We have to follow the teachings of Christ and make disciples. All of us, within the sound of my voice, those watching, those maybe listening to the podcast a year from now, all of us are commissioned to go and make disciples. And Pastor Dave, sometimes they say, well, that's what we pay the pastor for. That's what we pay the pastor for. All of us, all of us are called. That's why we do what we do. We took the call of God that we felt he was asking for us to do. We were on a mission trip in 2003 to Costa Rica. We had gone in between 1997, I told you, our first mission trip ever. And every year we would just take our vacation time and we would go as the door would open and we went to different nations, never dreaming or even imagining one day that that is what God would ask us to do. And in 2003, we were in Costa Rica. And the missionary had said to us, we have two options. We can stay in the city and paint school buildings, or we can go to an indigenous tribe that has never heard the gospel before. And we're like, sign us up for that. And we went into this mountain. It was, they called it the mountain of death to even get to where we were. We get to where the car can no longer drive, and the mountain is on fire. They were clear-cutting or burning off or whatever, and we had external backpacks and tents. And we're hiking at the end of the road. We're hiking to go build a church. And on that mountain, the missionary, we're there, and we're just having a time of worship around this fire. And the missionary says to each of us, and it wasn't one that he was asking for an answer, but he says, if God asks you, will you go? And I'll tell you, that wasn't what my first uh, thought would have been to say yes. But I wrestled like Jacob of old, and I wrestled with God. And I'm like, God, if you ask us to go, we will go. Little did we know the phone would ring so quick. <laughs> And I said many times to God, wrong number, <laughs> wrong address. I think you want the guy up the street. But we're called to obedience. And we do what we do because there are lost people who don't know that there is a God who loves them. They don't know that there's a Messiah and a Savior that has come to set them free. For us, we're investing in God's kingdom. God is at work all around the world, and we're investing in His kingdom. And we hear the stories of what God is doing around the world in some places that are seemingly so remote, but people are being saved in the strangest places in the world. And so we go to another nation, but here's what we go with. We go with authority and power from our King. He is the utmost and highest authority. God is sovereign over nations. He doesn't have borders. He doesn't have a, a, a river that He can't cross. He is sovereign over nations. And He has given all of us all power and authority. We speak on behalf of our King. He's given us that that power and authority, He calls us His ambassadors to represent Him to the world. And here's the other part that's exciting is that we're all in this together. This is our church, New Life. You guys are with us. We are connected. We are connected. We are partners in this venture. All of us are His body. And think about this. We're His literal hands when you literally put your hand on someone to pray for them or to give someone a hug, your feet that bring that good news to them and our voice is the audible voice of God. We are literally His hands and His feet and His voice to the world. 
I don't know if you think of it in those terms, but we are. We are the literal hands of Jesus. We can hear the voice of God within us. It's rare that it's audible, but we can be the voice of God to someone. We can give an encouraging word. We can pray for people. We can open the scriptures to them and actually declare the living words of God. Another thing we do as followers of Christ is ref reflect his glory to the world who does not know him. Jesus said this of himself, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember, they didn't know the Father. Let's show the world the Father by being like Jesus, a living copy of our Master. As a disciple, we should be replicating Jesus to the world. Where we serve, we've shared this with you last time, Scotland is known as a post-Christian nation. 98% are completely lost. There is less than 2% of all faiths that attend any church regularly. We need to show Jesus to that nation. And we could show them by our lives. We can demonstrate the love of the Father. So friends, we know that history is wrapping up. We can see that it seems almost like time is, is speeding along. Things seem to be going quicker than they ever have before. This can be the church's capital C, the church's finest hour, or will we shrink back in fear, or will we stand up boldly against the onslaught of the enemy of our souls? This can be our finest hour, church. We can show Christ to the world like never before. This can be our finest hour. I heard this quote recently, a world at its worst needs a church at its best. I'm, I'm round and third. I'm round and third bringing it home. I just want to share with you just quickly, this is out of uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 6. And it's a, a little bit of a, a chunk of Scripture, but it's what Paul was saying. There was a bit of a faction going on. And some were saying they were of Apollos. And some said, no, I, I follow Paul. And so Paul weighs in on the matter. This is 1 Corinthians 3, 6. Paul says this, I planted and Apollos watered, but God all the while was making it grow, and he gave the increase. So neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but only God who makes it grow and become greater. He who plants and he who waters are equal, meaning they're one in aim and of the same importance and esteem. Yet each shall receive his own reward. Amen. According to their own labor. For we say we. That means we. That's us. We are fellow workmen. We are joint promoters, laborers together with and for God. And you are God's garden and vineyard and field under cultivation. You are God's building. According to the grace, the special endowment for my task of God bestowed on me, like a skillful architect and master builder, I laid the foundation, and now another man is building upon it. But let each man be careful how he builds it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which was already laid, which is Jesus Christ, our Messiah, or the Anointed One. But if anyone, say anyone, that means anyone. They build on the foundation, whether it be with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, the work of each one will become plainly and openly known and shown for what it is. For the day of Christ will di disclose and declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test and critically appraise the character and worth of the work that each person does. And if the work which any person has built on the foundation, any product of his efforts whatsoever, survives this test, he will get his reward. But if any person's work is burned up under the test, 
He will suffer the loss of it all, losing his reward, though he himself will be saved, but only as one who has passed through the fire. And so for us, we want to build God's kingdom, God's way. We don't want to lose out on our reward. We want to do what God has asked us to do. And I challenge you to do what God has asked you to do. And so if it's go, go. If it's pray, pray. If it's give, give. Whatever each one God has asked each of you to do. Jesus taught us this, pastor, as you said today in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we do what we do because we couldn't not do it. <laughs> we didn't want to be like Oscar Schindler looking back at the end. We didn't want to be looking back at the end going, God, there was more lives we could have touched. If only we could have. But maybe, someday. God asks each of us to obey Him. And He gives us the ability to do it. I'm just going to ask if you'll...